uh, time to point out a distinction between the definition of the protocol itself and the way it happens to be implemented in one pack, one software package, uh, namely our own package. So uh, I've already described the, the protocol to you, at least in, in its basic form. Uh, so a few comments here about the way it's implemented here. Uh, we've included rig control, basic rig control for setting frequency and uh, changing frequencies and so forth uh, for nearly all modern radios. That's one of the, the ways in which uh, Bill Somerville, G4WJS, has uh, made such major contributions to, uh, to our software. Uh, we have uh, adopted uh, individual frequencies on each of the HF and, and lower VHF bands, where, which essentially are the meeting places where everybody goes to look for FTA QSOs. And it, it is so much concentrated activity that uh, probably we're going to need to expand into somewhat wider frequency usage uh, in future if, if this kind of activity uh, and interest continues. Uh, to put everybody in a, in a single 3 kilohertz passband is pushing it a bit. Uh, at first it was okay, it's, it's getting out so the 20 meters, uh, it's, it's hard to get through sometimes, the band is just too full. So we should start moving up the band a bit. Uh, probably we will step on some toes when we do that, uh, because other people are doing other things there, and it's not clear exactly how, uh, how best that uh, problem will be solved. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure we can work it out over time. Uh, there will be some ruffled feathers for a while. Uh, and uh, we have tried to stay out of the business of defining what frequency should be used. We have instead uh, adopted uh, suggestions made by others and said, okay, if that's the, where you think the activity should be, we'll put that in the program and that will be the default for now, but we could change it sometime in the future. And I think we're going to have to have user input, uh, perhaps even from things like uh, uh, national committees of some kind that uh, help to set band plans. I know in Europe, you, I think you probably do that thing somewhat uh, more thoroughly than we have done it in North America. Uh, but ARRL does have committees uh, that set uh, recommended frequencies. They tend to be out of date, and, uh, and we need to bring them up to date. Um, Let's see, the way FT8 works in uh, WSJTX, of course, and one of the reasons it's so popular is that you don't just decode the station you're talking to, you decode everybody in the band. And we can do that because computers are so fast these days, we can process each signal as we go up uh, the, in, over this whole uh, three to five kilohertz window and decode them all. So not only can you uh, decode the station you're working, but you can see who else is on, who who they're talking to, and uh, read the mail, so to speak. Uh, you can pick up new countries or new states or uh, new uh, locators uh, by, by watching your screen. Uh, the decoders are actually uh, very good, I would say. Uh, and uh, one of the ways that I've been getting enjoyment out of this whole process myself is learning a whole new field. Uh, uh, you know, I'm a physicist, I'm not a, a computer scientist or, a, or an information theorist, but I've been teaching myself information theory since I retired uh, from teaching, and uh, that, that's been a lot of fun. And uh, Steve Frank and I together uh, are, are teaching ourselves this, this uh, um, important field of, of, uh, of, of computer science theory. Uh, and we know, therefore, that these decoders that we've put into WSJTX are really good. They are state-of-the-art decoders, and, and uh, we approach the limits of, of information exchange at specified signal-to-noise ratios. So that's interesting, and it's important, and I think it's a, it's a contribution to ham radio to bring, uh, to bring us up to the forefront of, of, uh, of modern information exchange. Uh, as you know, if you've used these modes, uh, there is basically there's no partial copy. You don't ever get garbage, uh, or very seldom do you see garbage on your screen. And you don't miss just one or two characters of a message. You either get the whole thing or you get nothing. Uh, but you don't uh, very often have any, you, you don't have busted call signs where you're not exactly certain who you were. And you don't have to look it up on the web to see on the DX cluster. Uh, who the DX is, you see it right on your own screen if you're copying them. And if you're not copying them, you shouldn't be on there calling them, right? <laughs> right. You, gotta, you gotta copy them before you can work them. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, I, I don't know whether you do something like this in Europe, but in, in uh, the U.S. we have a frequency measuring contest uh, twice a year where a, a signal gets put on the air at a very precise frequency and other people try to measure the frequency. To do that, uh, you can actually do all that with WSJTX. You can calibrate your radio so that it's accurate to within better than one hertz. And uh, during, the, uh, during the frequency measuring test, you can measure the frequency of the unknown signal and send it in. And uh, if you, I think the way it normally works is there's an unknown signal on 80 meters, 40 meters, and 20 meters. If you get all of them within one hertz or better, you get a green star or something on the uh, on the on the website when when the uh, results are posted. That's a lot of fun, uh, and it's another way of, of bringing uh, uh, preci modern precision measurement techniques into ham radio. Uh, maybe just a few summary comments uh, about FT8. Uh, so it allows you to do essentially error-free communication uh, with minimal information exchange, minimal QSOs. It fills your log very quickly if you want to do that. And uh, as you probably know, it can be addictive. You start it going and you, you, know, you can make QSOs more or less as fast as the, as the software will allow. And uh, frankly, you can also read your email at the same time. And probably lots of people do that um, it, because it, uh, you know, it's sort of moderately automated. It's not completely automatic, and it can't. Uh, it doesn't make more than one QSO. So if you call CQ and somebody answers you, you you'll go through and send them the appropriate messages until it logs the QSO. But it will not start another one by itself. We did that because uh, we did not want to make a, a QSO robot. We want people to be in charge of what's going on. Uh, however, uh, it's obvious from the way the program works, if you have used it, that uh, it would not be very difficult to make it automated. And of course, a few people have done that because the software is all open source. If you're good at programming, you can change a few statements here and there and make it automatic. Or you can make some other kind of software that uh, basically goes around and clicks the buttons on, on WSJT. So we have tried to discourage that. Uh, we don't think it's a great idea, uh, but uh, there are some, uh, uh, actually if you come to the contest forum this afternoon, I think I'll show a slide that has a bunch of call signs on it. Those are all call signs which I would say are robots. <laughs> You know, I, I don't like it, but whatever. Uh, and I've already mentioned the names of some of these derivative programs, which some of you have probably used. Um, a few more words, maybe, about, uh, I guess I've already gave you the, the bottom line on uh, my friend Steve Frank and Bill Somerville uh, and the kinds of contributions they have made to this software. And uh, those are extremely important. And I should mention that, uh, and you've probably seen if you've ever looked at the, uh, at the, uh, screen at the window that pops up at the first time you initialize the program or if you uh, go to the help uh, menu and click on about, it'll put up a screen that has about uh, 20 call signs on it of other people who have made important contributions to the software over the years. Uh, some of those have come and gone, some of them have made contributions of, of uh, various different kinds and uh, they are, those are all important and all much appreciated and all a good uh, indicator of the good ham spirit that I think we all share and all uh, enjoy and it's part of what makes us uh, uh, a happy family worldwide uh, of ham radio operators. Uh, so let's, uh, let me just say a few things about uh, very recent developments. Um, we have recently changed from using standard frequency shift keying where uh, one tone finishes and the next tone immediately starts. Uh, so we, uh, in effect, the, the tones being transmitted uh, are changed instantaneously from one tone to the next. We have changed that slightly in a way that I'll describe more in a minute. And so the correct uh, uh, nomenclature now for the actual transmission mode in the next version of the program that will be released uh, is called Gaussian frequency shift keying. The G there stands for Gaussian, which means basically that the uh, frequency changes are slightly smooth so that instead of uh, a frequency jumping from this tone to this tone, it gradually moves up to the next tone. And uh, the importance of that will be made clear in a minute when I show you a spectrum. Uh, 
it allows us to do, uh, uh, basically it makes the signal narrower, it, it reduces the sidebands. Uh, if you've ever looked at the spectrum of a standard uh, RTTY signal, a ready signal, uh, they have a significant keying sidebands that go out for a kilohertz or more. And FT8 also did that, although it's a slower keying rate, so it, it didn't go out at kilohertz. It still went out a, a few hundred hertz. And the new Gaussian frequency shift keying uh, has very steep skirts that go down uh, 80 dB and more uh, before they, uh, you see any side lobes. So that's, uh, that's a, that cleans up the transmitted signal by a significant amount. Um, we uh, have inter into the software we have put interesting features that probably those of you who have used FTA a lot already know about that uh, we can detect a signal, decode it, and then subtract it from the received signal and look beneath that and see if there's any other signal that was covered up at first by the first signal. And you sometimes will see signals decoded at exactly the same frequency or maybe a frequency different by only one or two hertz. That's because we do this signal subtraction and multi-pass decoding. That's an, a, a very important feature of the, of the uh, software and, and uh, is possible uh, only because once we have decoded a signal, we can re-encode it in the receiving software so we know exactly what the waveform should have been so we can subtract it out. And uh, that works very effectively. And uh, that, again, is a, an application of, of techniques that haven't been used in ham radio before, I think. It improves the, uh, uh, the number of signals that you can decode in a, in a narrow uh, subband uh, of any of the HF bands. Uh, we've uh, implemented a number of, of uh, decoding techniques which are uh, at the forefront of uh, this kind of information theory. We've improved the speed of the decoders. We've uh, tested the software under uh, various propagation models uh, that are the standards for the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU. So we, we actually have a simulator for uh, different types of paths, for mid-latitude, for high-latitude, for low-latitude, and so forth, so we can optimize the uh, decoding software for uh, a wide variety of different propagating conditions, and that also increases the ability to work different kinds of, uh, of DX. And finally, we're developing this new mode that we've called uh, FT4, which is particularly designed for uh, radio contesting. And I'll say a few words about that in, uh, in winding things up. So a little more about the Gaussian frequency shift key. The upper uh, um, waveform there, it's not a waveform, it's a, it's, a, it's a plot of frequency as a function of time. So those are the frequency steps, the red curve, the frequency steps are uh, rectangular edges. They, they jump from one frequency to the next right away. The one down below is the same waveform, the same uh, message being transmitted, but it's, the edges are smoothed out a little bit. And the difference doesn't look very great there. The, you know, the smooth one looks almost like the rectangular one, but the difference in spectrum is astonishing. And here's an on-the-air uh, comparison, somebody using the new uh, mode uh, WSJTX in version 2.1. Uh, his signal looks very, very straight all the way down to the baseline, whereas the 2.0 signal has skirts that uh, go out on the sides. And here is the same thing. Uh, those were actual on-the-air signals. Um, interestingly, we just happened to catch a, an instance where uh, somebody using the, the new beta release version of the software and somebody else using the standard software um, with signals that happen to be the same at uh, Steve Frank's QTH when he was recording this. You'll notice also that uh, the signal with the, with the sidebands also looks wider on the, on the waterfall. You can see the sidebands there and you've all seen that on the screen, I'm sure. You don't see that so much on the new signal, it's, it's narrow. And uh, I think that's going to be a big improvement. So when everybody upgrades to version 2.1, uh, maybe about a month from now, <laughs> that, that's, that's our plan, uh, you should definitely upgrade and your signal will look substantially cleaner if everything else is good. Here's what it looks like with simulated signals, so you can actually do the measurements accurately uh, in, in dB. And I, I put a minus 80 dB uh, yellow line there, and you can see that the Again, the new signals over here go all the way down to minus 80 or even minus 100 dB uh, before they start to broaden out. And the uh, the FT8 signal is the one uh, 
that uh, second from the right, and the FT4 signal all the way over on the right uh, is, uh, is shown as well. The, the, I showed the Ritty signal only to show you how ugly it is. <laughs> uh, I, I, I should point out, uh, uh, thoughtful Ritty operators have, have known this, of course, for years. Everybody knows it, and if, if they use Ritty, and uh, they have actually applied filtering, maybe in software, that, that uh, filters things out so that you cut off these sidebands, and that's all very well. But it turns out there's a disadvantage.